Welcome everyone. Our webinar will begin shortly. Hello, and welcome to today's online discussion, Preparing an Inclusive Online Course. I'm Kevin Kelly, Academic Director at the Association of College and University Educators, or AQ, and together with our collaborative partners, we're proud to bring this series to life. Before we dive into today's topic, I'd like to review our agenda and establish a few participation guidelines. We'll start with a brief keynote from Dr. Farah Ward before asking our panelists to introduce practices and strategies for preparing an inclusive online course. And we'll reserve most of today's session, about 35 minutes for discussion and Q&A with you. Our goal is to have an interactive conversation focused on this topic with practical ideas that you can take back and start using right away. Please pose your questions using the Q&A function that we'll moderate and discuss with our panelists. Toward the end of the hour, we'll share how we can continue the conversation online and share some additional resources to support your teaching. At the bottom of the Zoom window, you'll see a closed caption button. If you'd like to use captions, just click that button and choose the view show subtitle option. Last, I also want to let you know that we'll be asking for your feedback as our time comes to a close please take a few minutes to share your thoughts so that we can be sure to continue providing you with the most relevant resources. So I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Farah Ward to our discussion today. She'll spend the next few minutes setting the stage for our conversation before joining us later for our Q&A. She's the Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Elizabeth City State University. Dr. Ward, welcome. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and, and thank you, Aki, for having me here today to talk about this very important topic. Um, although creating an inclusive online learning environment has always been important, I think that you know it, it would go without saying if I didn't acknowledge that in the times that we are currently in with COVID-19, it's even more important right now to ensure that we're creating our courses that are inclusive and acknowledging what's going on with the world. Of course, in a traditional semester, students generally have a choice on what type of courses they enroll in. Even at smaller institutions where, you know, there may only be an online course being delivered for that particular class that a student needs. In general, it does not mean that 75 or even 100% of their courses will be delivered in that format. Unfortunately, or fortunately, in this situation, COVID-19 has forced some universities to take choice away from some of the students. Um, some of the universities, of course, are doing 100% online to protect the health and safety of our students, and so are not allowing students to take face-to-face -face courses. But even in those universities that are enrolling in face-to-face -face courses, Significantly, significant a number of them because of the COVID-19 capacity restrictions are still either increasing the number of courses they're offering in an online environment or even offering hybrid courses where maybe half of the courses is also taught online and then some days that they are face-to-face. -face. Those type of things do force the students to not have the choice that they traditionally had. And then of course, there's also another situation where some cases students because of their circumstances are opting into online courses, even though that's something that they traditionally wouldn't do. Um, students may have personal pre-existing conditions or concerns about their health. Their family may have decided that they wanted the student to stay home that semester. Or even for financial reasons, students may want to save money. Maybe a parent lost their job during this current economic time. 
and therefore they decided not to pay that room and board and to enroll in most of their courses online. And of course, another option, because even the K through 12 systems schools are online, in some instances, a parent may have a college level student stay at home to help them take care of their sibling who is in online classes. So for those reasons, although again, this semester and really this whole academic year is really not what we normally would have. And so why, whether it's the university forcing the student to take online courses because that's the delivery mode or students kind of by default forcing to take in online courses, this semester and, and it'll be the same thing I'm sure in the spring are going to make bio online courses a lot different than what we traditionally have. So the shift to online because of default makes it really essential now more than ever for faculty to really be conscious about the population of students they have. I would say that this year is even different from the ones previous. Some of the things that students um, are having to deal with make them not be kind of the ideal student uh, or the ideal structure that um, faculty would tend to think their students would be enrolled in. Of course, we would all like to think that students are at home taking course, they have rooms by themselves, they have their own computer, maybe their parents wake up in the morning and make their breakfast, lunch, and, and they have a full dinner at night. But the reality is that that ideal student is probably uh, the minority of the students that we have enrolled in our courses. Students are dealing with a variety of things from food insecurity, um, some students may be sharing a room with a, a sibling, maybe even sharing a bed with a sibling, where if they were living on campus, they would have their own bed in their own residence halls. Students may be sharing a computer with a family member, or even sharing a space with their sibling who is also taking courses online at the same time. And so because of these differing environments, it's really essential for faculty to remain conscious that students are learning in different things. Of course, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, I talked to my faculty center chair actually, and he said, you know, it's difficult. I often um, am teaching sometimes to a screen full of black squares with white words, which is often difficult. And I, and I think we all understand that. But one thing that I even spoke with him about is that you also have to be conscious of, there could be a reason behind why they don't want to share their screen. Um, they could be in a parking lot. They could not want to share what the, their background looks like. And so we do have to be conscious on both ends of the story. I know faculty can't really control those issues about students' um, personal situations that I just discussed, but I think being aware of them and thinking about how we design our online classes to assist them is really what's essential and most important during this time. Of course, today you'll hear, hear about a lot of things, but some things that I think is important for us all to remember is that faculty just really should have empathy during this time. Again, students are in situations and, and faculty members may never know what their students are going through. Also understand that students don't necessarily know how to use all the technology that they're provided. And so teaching them through that is really going to be important. Students understand differently. And so, of course, making sure that we are still reaching these different learners is important, as well as helping students know where to go from, for help. Again, if they're face to face, they tend to know where the counseling center is, know where financial aid is, know where to go if they need help with that, that technology. That part, portion is taken away when they're on that online in their environment. And then lastly, I would like to say that I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that, you know, tomorrow is World Mental Health Day. And so faculty are also dealing with things during the, these stresses. Their spouse may have lost their job. They may also be teaching their children during this environment. And so faculty should give grace to themselves to make sure they work through. We'll hear a lot of things today. And if you just take one additional thing from what you hear today, you will be improving your course. So thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. You clearly outlined many of the challenges our students face, especially the challenges that have been amplified by today's circumstances. And you also shared a few ideas for what faculty can do to create an inclusive online environment and help, help them succeed, starting with showing empathy, which is so important. And I love the fact that you brought it back to the fact that we also have to show empathy to ourselves and to our colleagues. Uh, and so uh, now I'd like to keep that going. I'd like to introduce you to our panelists who will continue the conversation. First, we have Dr. Jose Antonio Bowen, former president of Goucher College, former dean at Miami University and Southern Methodist University. He's the author of Teaching Naked, How Moving Technology Out of Your College Classroom Will Improve Student Learning. Where he's joined by Santiba Campbell, an assistant professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Bennett College. She's also the director of special academic initiatives at Bennett College. And last but not least, Christina Ruiz Mesa. Dr. Ruiz Mesa is an associate professor and basic course director in the Department of Communication Studies at California State University, Los Angeles. She'll join Dr. Campbell and Dr. Bowen today. And I am excited to get us started. I'm honored to be moderating this conversation. So um, let's get going. Christina, thank you for agreeing to start the conversation. Absolutely, thank you. And hi, everyone. Today, when I'm thinking about designing online courses, the first thing I think about is how can I challenge the canon? How can I make this course different so that I'm not reproducing the same topics and talking about the same scholars that we've been talking about this course in this course for the last decade? And so when I do that, I next think about course design. And when I think about course design, I think about my learning outcomes as my final destination. And every module, every week leads me a step closer to those learning outcomes. And so when I think about how I'm achieving those, I also think about what I want my students to walk away from. What do I want them to remember in six months, in a year that they carry into their careers with? And so when I think about the choices that we make, what, how are we scaffolding knowledge? How are we building on each module each week to help students succeed? And then when I'm thinking about my course materials and what I'm including, I think about how are my students, I teach in East LA with predominantly students of color, first generation college students, how are they represented in the material? How are they seeing themselves in the scholars and the topics and the discussions and the examples that we're using? And so when I'm thinking about this, I think about each component of my course, is it contributing to my goal of inclusion, of making sure that all of my students feel and know that they belong in this class and on this campus? And additionally, when I think about how we frame discussions about diversity, equity, inclusion, I think about our campus and our community resources. How are we talking about those in our syllabus? Are we just mentioning them in the syllabus and then walking away and forgetting about it for the rest of the semester? Or are we taking time throughout the semester to remind students about the resources that are available on campus and off? And I often think about this in my syllabus and I think about the litany of resources we talk about. And we say we have a Dreamer Center, a Veterans Resource Center, a Housing and Security Center, a food pantry. But are we doing anything to help to um, remove those stigmas around housing insecurity or food insecurity or mental health? And so when I think about this, in my syllabus, I add the centers, the resources, the websites, and I typically add a statistic or a piece of data about the services provided and who utilizes them to help normalize and remove stigma. So for example, I will talk about the National Alliance of Mental Illness, and I'll say that one in five college students will experience some sort of mental health crisis or condition. And so this functions to help students utilize these resources and to know they're not alone. And in addition to using the syllabus as a resource, I think about the language that we include in the syllabus. So how are we thinking about the ways that our lecture materials, our readings, our examples, our media are working towards our goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion? And so when I, before the class even starts, when I have my introduction video, when I have my segment on the syllabus about who I am, I make sure that I add my pronouns, I make sure that I add a pronunciation guide, because much like our students want their names honored and respected and said correctly, so do we as instructors. So I think it's important that we model for um, our students what we, what we do. And so um, when we do that, I think that 
we are providing that space in class for students to make sure that their names are said correctly, that we are using their pronouns, that we are using and honoring them in ways that they would like. And so just to recap, um, I, want to, I want us to think about the ways that we challenge the canon, the ways that we include resources and topics, up and coming scholars, scholars that are publishing in open access and in um, different kinds of journals. I wanna think about the ways that we plan backwards. So what are the goals of our course? How can we get our students there? And how is each module building on that learning? I want us to talk about campus resources and services and who is served by them to use inclusive language, eliminating gender binaries in our talking and making sure that our language, our oral communication, our written communication is modeling the inclusive learning environment that we want for our students. And most importantly, be a kind and empathetic vocal advocate and student supporter. Now more than ever, it's important that we are modeling for our students the kindness and empathy that we want to see around us. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Christina. Uh, Santiba, would you like to build on Christina's ideas, whether it be challenging the canon, planning backwards, or anything else she brought up? Absolutely. I think we have to continue with the communication piece that um, she was sharing, because once we develop these amazing um, syllabi for our classes, we got to make sure we're actually communicating the ideas properly to our students. And with that communication, focus on accessibility, right? Not making the assumption that all students have access to a computer, right? Will your assignments be accessible via a cell phone or an iPad or some other uh, digital platform? Uh, is your learning management um, system set up to do so as well? Because as Dr. Ward alluded to in the opening, all of our students aren't sitting at home with laptops, right? Or, or access to desktop computers, or they may even be borrowing. Uh, so sometimes things like making sure your documents are also PDFs, right? In case that student doesn't have access to Word, right? But we can open it up via PDF files as well. So another important to think about. And all of this, again, coming back to how are we communicating these ideas. So we want to make sure that with that information we see in the syllabus that is also accessible, um, not just from content wise, but also engagement with you. So for example, if your office hours, you, know, you might have been able to have a, a pretty set number or a time that you would be available to meet with students, but in this type of environment, we're going to have to look at things a little differently now, right? So maybe those office hours are going to be in the evenings because a lot of our students are working since they are at home and there might be other family situations like layoffs or other things that have occurred due to coronavirus where now that student is trying to chip in. But Going back to my point about access to the laptop, we might actually have to also have those meetings via cell phone or text and um, using things that students already know well. Uh, my students love GroupMe. They actually introduced me to GroupMe. So I've actually held office hours via DMs on GroupMe, right? Or also using GroupMe for them to support one another, right? So it's a free service that you can do. And also protecting our own time and space. So we need to be flexible and be able to reach out to the students now. But at the same time, I'm not saying give out your personal cell phone number, but if you use something like an app like GroupMe, they can still reach out and contact you from something that they're very accustomed to and using like a cell phone, right? And using that cell phone for those office hours or for those quick check-ins because email might not always be the best mode of communication to use with them at this time. Fantastic. And Jose, what do the ideas that Christina and Santiba brought up raise for you? I can imagine having read Teaching Naked that you might have some ideas about uh, policies for a syllabus, perhaps. Yeah, so those are, those are great ideas. And, and Christina gave a terrific overview in such a short time about all of the things to think about in your syllabus. Um, I would drill down and just add my um, I think that an e-communication policy, which is probably, you know, obvious if you're teaching an online course, um, but think about what to include there, um, right? So an e-communication policy is not just, you know, office hours, phone number, it's, it's how fast do you respond to email and when do you respond to email or, do, or are you on, do you do Google Hangouts? Do you do Facebook chat? Uh, I, I don't know you uh, and you may feel uncomfortable with some of those things. Are you on Twitter? Um, so, so let me know where you are. Is it okay to friend you? Is it okay? You know, those sorts of things. Um, but I think the thing that's most useful is giving students something about your personal habits, which is 
I do email Monday through Friday. If you email me from nine to five, I will respond within 24 hours, within four hours. Uh, I don't do email on the weekends or, you know, I will respond to all email within 24 hours, right? There's no right way to do it, but let me know because again, the, we talked about mental health, uh, the student, student anxiety is high. Um, the more I know about, oh, this is gonna take 24 hours, this is gonna take a little longer, the better. So uh, I just think thinking about your e-communication policy uh, and thinking about, um, and ask your students, what do they need to know, right? We talked about empathy and about listening to students at this trying time. Um, but I think th there's probably a different set of things than we're used to providing. And that's true of online, but it's especially true now during COVID uh, when people need more, more access and they want more security. Thanks, Jose. Santiba, Christina got us started by thinking about topics like planning backwards and the things that we do before the semester or quarter begins. Can you kind of pull us forward into what we do as we're facilitating the course? And I know you talked about an app group, maybe pull in a few other apps that you know about and anything else that you think is relevant about creating an inclusive course environment while we're actually supporting the students in the learning process. Um, absolutely. Once you have that syllabus laid out, you're going to have to figure out how to implement it. And that's where that communications piece becomes so important. Um, having to even revamp those assignments. Assignments that may have worked when you were face-to-face -face are not necessarily going to work in an online environment because it's not going to have the same level of engagement with the students. So you might want to introduce other types of apps that could allow for similar engagement. Um, for example, at um, Bennett College, we're currently partnering with Circle In. So Circle In is a great remote study app where it actually puts the students into um, a class study group. So everyone in the class is in the group. So if a student has a question, you know, and they're, they're on student hours at midnight, they may not be able to access me at midnight, but they could easily go into their Circle In app and say, you know, can somebody remind me what was the purpose of dendrites? The ping goes out to everybody in the study group and anyone can answer it, right? Um, there's also features in there that can allow them to have access to like whiteboard spaces and whatnot. So if you have an app like that, why not then integrate an assignment into that, right? So one of the um, big components that um, AQ always shares is about the welcome or the introduction, right? So you always wanna make sure you're not only introducing yourself to the students, but actually having the students introduce themselves to one another. Right? So why not have an opening activity that will be an introduction that they can do via the app? Since everyone may not be able to come together for a Zoom meeting, but oftentimes students will have access to their cell phones where they can then have that same type of camaraderie so you can start to establish identity. Because I think a big component of uh, doing online teaching is making sure that student has an identity where they are genuinely connected with the course, which then you can then play back to the institution. Thank you so much. Again, really rich ideas. Um, Jose, is there anything you'd like to say to build on what Santiba just brought up? So those are uh, great ideas about uh, and uh, specific suggestions for you know using using apps. Um, I guess the only thing I'd add is that you know this might be the time to go low tech. Uh, you know, normally during the face to face, you know, you know, we would say we not give out our our home number or our cell number. We'd probably not call students on the phone, uh, that sort of thing. This is an unusual time. And so I think it's appropriate to make a phone call and say, hi, how you doing? Yeah, we obviously you can do that with 500 students. Um, but my point is only that I think this is a good moment to think, you know, where are my normal professional private boundary? Um, and maybe it's worth it to reach out a little further for students to show that I am here, I care. If there's anything that you need, let me know. And so, yeah, during normal times, it might be a little creepy to call a student, but since nobody is hanging out in the parking lot, no, right, there aren't those other opportunities for the random interaction, we can't rely on random. And so I think it is, it is appropriate and reasonable to just say, um, you know, if, if you're okay, especially if you have a group me chat kind of thing, or you have you share text, you know, phone numbers for, for group text uh, to say, you know, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I may just check in on you once or twice and just have that conversation. It breaks down that barrier uh, because office hours are hard, but scheduling that 
that Zoom meeting for students is just that much harder. And so I just think this is a time to be thinking about relaxing some of those restrictions. Great. And Christina, do you have anything you'd like to add to the conversation about implementing these different practices? I love the ideas that my colleagues have shared. And one of the things that I keep thinking about is transparency. So we care about students, but how do we tell them and how do we show them that we care? And we know, um, I'm a communication scholar, so we know that the ways that we communicate care is uh, culturally informed, is uh, informed by our different professional roles and positions. And so that transparency saying, the reason that I'm doing this is because I want you to be successful. I want, so I think saying that and being transparent about our actions and why we're doing things can go a long way right now. And always really. Thanks, Christina. And I see in the Q&A, Jennifer asked about, is Jose uh, suggesting that we share our personal phone number? Well, I know one strategy is to use something called Google Voice. And I use that as a way to provide alternative pathways for students to submit an essay. If they don't have a device, as uh, Dr. Ward and Dr. Campbell have brought up, they could write their essay with a pen and paper and then just use a voicemail message on Google Voice, which is free. And then I can grade that paper using the same rubric. I'm just listening to it. On, it's a book on tape instead of a book. <laughs> it's an essay on voicemail. So um, I'd like to uh, bring it back now and have maybe Jose give us his thoughts uh, as we move this conversation forward and head into that Q&A. So, generally true for online but i think especially during covid we got a lot of data back in the spring about what students liked or didn't like about our our move uh, from face to face to uh, emergency remote teaching i'm just going to remind everybody that emergency remote teaching is not the same as online teaching it might be to me if 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 online teaching is like star wars the movie then emergency remote teaching is like star wars the play right? Not quite the same thing, right? And so you're a little, so, so trying to transpose from one to another doesn't always work. Um, but students told us two things. Um, the, the, there, there are a couple of surveys about the spring. One is that they wanted more structure, and the other is they wanted more flexibility. <laughs> um, and, and that sounds a little contradictory, but it's really not, right? Uh, so as Christina was saying about transparency, about, you know, syllabus, about structure, about all the, all the pieces coming together. So students want more structure, but they also want more flexibility about deadlines. They want to be treated like human beings. They, they want you to understand when, when stuff happens. So uh, that means things like rubrics, right? Giving became more important. Let me know what matters, what pieces of the assignment are. Early feedback is even more critical uh, than it is face-to-face -face, and certainly during this time. Um, so I also, I, I've, I've, there'll be, um, I'll, I'll share this um, from my new book about study support. Uh, well, the new book is not about study support, it's about the three R's, but there's a section on study support and I've made it available because I think for this COVID time, the idea of giving students a structure for how to study is even more important. Uh, so Christina mentioned resources. So um, I, I give students a template, uh, and so I give it to you and you can customize it, that says, well, here are the various things you could do this week to study. So it's both, you know, how many hours do you think you need to study to get an A or whatever, but it's also, you know, you could go to the writing center, you could reread the chapter, various sorts of things. But then at the end of the week, you have to get students to go back and say, well, what did you do and what worked, right? What really worked for you? Did working alone work? Uh, did working in a group, did anybody, you know, did going to the writing center actually, oh, well, that was really the more, I should do more of that, right? But we're trying to help ultimately, good teachers, we want to make ourselves obsolete, right? We want students to be able to self-manage all of this. And so trying to provide it just enough structure for students to say, here are some ideas, and then an opportunity for reflection, right? What worked last week? And it doesn't, it could take five minutes, but what worked, what things were most valuable? And then students, you don't have to tell them, they'll say, oh, I should do more of that and less of this. Rereading the chapter wasn't as useful as starting my paper earlier. Um, and so providing more scaffolding, as was mentioned, more, more structure um, for students to know how the weeks are going to progress, how things go together. But then also being more of a, of a, of a human being, more empathy and saying, uh, I am, you know, I understand. Uh, as, as, as Sativa was just saying, um, no, as Christina was just saying, it's just transparency, right? That it's the communication that I have high standards and I'm going to help you get there. 
that, that letting students know this is hard and this is important and you were going to get there and it is going to be hard but i am here to help that combination is really the secret sauce um providing both both of those things uh, in in student terms it's the design and the human having having the two together it's not one or the other you really have to do both thank you jose uh, Santiba, do you have any ideas that you want to add about flexibility and structure and that uh, balance between the two? Um, yes, I, I want to build on the idea that Christina was talking about with the transparency, because I think the structure and um, flexibility speaks to us as faculty as well, right? So we do need to be transparent to let them know what's going on, which means we're going to have to have our own sense of structure, but yet also be flexible and, and realize that your syllabus is probably going to have to be adapted. Right. Um, we also have to be able to um, be flexible for upcoming events. Right. We don't really know when this global pandemic uh, will change. Uh, we've also had major uh, societal incidents that have occurred, you know, an influx of more uh, blading overt styles of racism that we haven't seen in the past. We're in the midst of an election season, right? Uh, we're about to come into a holiday season. You know, the holidays themselves are, you know, amazing for some, but not for everybody. So we're literally trending towards a perfect storm. So as faculty, we need to make sure we're ready with our own selves with a certain level of structure and flexibility because our courses are only going to be as grounded as we are. So we're definitely going to have to take a moment to, to think about that because we cannot bring our stress and anxiety into the classroom. We got to start being prepared for those students and their stress and anxiety. So we might need to start thinking about that now. So I, I love the idea of having the structure, but also being flexible, but not only for the students, but for the sake of us as well as we're developing these courses. Christina, do you have any thoughts to wrap up this topic before we move to the Q&A? I do. I love, um, I love what Santita was just saying about kind of being self-reflexive and being critical, critically self-reflexive of ourselves, right? Because we, you know, those of us who've been teaching for a while, or maybe not, have an idea of how we're supposed to perform, how are we supposed to be with our students, right? So um, both Jose and uh, Santiba have talked about this, and I think that we have to allow ourselves the grace and the flexibility that we are also hoping for and modeling for our students. And I think that um, that this blurring of those boundaries, as Jose said earlier, is really an important process for us as educators and as humans, and making sure that we are allowing ourselves uh, both the structure and the flexibility inside the classroom, the virtual classroom, and uh, in, our, in our home life as well. Oh, and I want to jump into that because I, I love that idea. And so normally I say to people, you know, you have to be an intellectual role model, right? That your struggles, when you say, I, I had tr trouble with math, I didn't like this problem, you know, that modeling that failure is important. Um, and that, I normally think about that in terms of, right, the content of the intellectual struggles in our class. But I think right now, it's really important to say to students, you know, I'm struggling with not reading the news too. <laughs> I mean, this, you know, all that's going on in the world to say, I am not at my full capacity. I, I don't have complete bandwidth because I'm a human being just like you. And so I know that you're not going to be able to learn as much this semester, just as I am not going to be able to teach as, teach as well, because there's this world out there that's intruding into our lives. And so I think modeling for students that we are human, that we are also feeling some of the same anxieties and pressures, and that, that diminishes our performance give students permission to recognize that they too are going to have diminished performance this semester. Thanks, Jose. And I think uh, jumping to the Q&A now, and I wanna pull Dr. Ward back in to help answer these questions. The last two comments, Christina talked about, this is a time where we may need to blur boundaries. Jose talked about uh, modeling what it means to be a human. A comment from one of the participants is I understand what the panelists are saying. However, as a woman of color who has often been placed in a caretaking role with my students, I'm concerned about perpetuating stereotypes of the roles of black women. Do any of you have any ideas on how to straddle that very delicate balance there? I'm sure. I think it's a reality. Um, I think that, you know, during this time, it's definitely, there are definitely still pressures, especially in academia, depending on where you are in the spectrum, 
you know, you still have to progress. And so how do you protect yourself? It was one of the reasons that I started off saying that, um, you know, mentioning World Mental Health Day, because I think that it is important and I have seen it unfortunately happen that particularly for African-American women, the service commitments that sometimes institutions put, especially if they're at a majority institution, um, you know, the minority committee, the diversity and inclusion committee, while extremely important and plays an extremely important role, um, how is that also progressing their professional kind of goals and aspirations? And it's something that they definitely have to measure. And so um, it, it is tough. And, but I, I, would tell, I would tell that person that to protect themselves, be honest, and you know, try to even have relationships with their colleagues, which I know sometimes is difficult, but they can't do it themselves. And so, you know, I always say, you know, there's an important reason why in when we get back to regular flight, they tell you to put the mask on yourself first before you help your child beside you. And it's for that very reason. You do have to protect yourself first. And so, you know, I know the guilt is probably somewhat there sometimes, but um, you cannot help anyone else if you have not taken care of yourself first. I would agree 100% uh, with Dr. Ward's points. I, I think we've all heard the saying, you can't pour from an empty cup, right? And um, I can definitely uh, empathize as, as a Black woman who's been in that situation and also as a Black woman who works at a, a historically Black college for women. Um, that's why when we were first talking about the, the calling the students and sharing of the numbers, <laughs> before I could even get it out, Kevin had already mentioned about using that, that Google Voice. Um, I, that's something I could not do because students will blow up my cell phone. So I, I, can't, I can't be that open and flexible, and I'm doing that to protect myself, right? Because I can't turn into everybody's auntie, because you're right, the stereotype will occur. So that's where we come back to that idea of that structure and flexibility. So this is a time where we're gonna to have to be more transparent. So I think it's okay to, to let the student know sometimes that you're tired, right? We don't wanna fall victim to the strong black woman phenomenon because of everything that's going on in society right now, because then what's gonna to happen to you, right? I mean, outside of the, the, the poetry that has shown this, we have empirical evidence as well that oftentimes as black women, we are the mules of the world. But this right now is not the time for you to be that mule, right? Because as I alluded to before, your classes are only going to be as grounded as you are. The support that you can provide is only going to be as great as you are. So I think you definitely have to take time to learn how to say no in these situations. Um, be flexible, but still establish those type of boundaries and use those other resources to assist you. Um, I did this when um, we were on campus and it's become even more beneficial You know now um, being remote, uh, since I am one of those people that's transitioning into being an online instructor. But you got to use your resources, as Christina alluded to earlier, right? So I still uh, refer students to the Counseling Center, right? Um, I, I'm a yogi, so I will send students the Headspace app, or the Calm app, or start working on mindfulness meditations into my class, right? And, and we do it as an institution. So don't always feel like you have to be the person for, um, providing, right? You can provide the resource and that's just as helpful. Thank you, Santiba. We're talking about starting from where we are and Santiba, I love that phrase, you can't pour out of an empty cup. That's uh, a lot of wisdom for as early as it is out here in California. <laughs> But I, I also recognize that we also view the world through our disciplinary lenses. And so one of the comments that we saw in the Q&A, when we say diversity, inclusion, or equity, parentheses, which are not synonymous in meaning and people use them differently, to some faculty, they don't believe it's relevant to them because they just teach math or accounting or whatever the subject. I'm gonna go back to the panel and say, do you have suggestions for how folks here in the, the participant group can address this way of thinking in, in a conversation with colleagues? So much to say. <laughs> uh, so I, I, my, I'll, let, I'll let my colleagues, uh, but I'll, I'll start with, so um, 
So if it's just math, then there shouldn't be anybody named Steve in there or Tom, right? That there was never anybody named Jose in my math homework, right? There was there were there were never, you know, uh, there were just trains and 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 na names of white guys. And so, uh, I, you know, we 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 are there is a cultural context here. Uh, the mathematicians you were teaching, uh, the names in your problems, uh, and 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 also just how comfortable I feel in a class if everybody else in the class doesn't look like me. Um, and so uh, I think especially um, if you're a white man teaching math, um, you need to think about um, how the other pe the people, people who are not like you in your class are approaching the subject. Um, right? All human beings are designed to assess the world for threat, right? Your amygdala in the back of your brain is designed to say, is it a tiger? No, right? And then, and then blood flow away from your brain to your legs, run, right? Fight or flight. So, so the word math, if that's scary, I can't learn math. That's not my fault. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I can't learn it because the blood flow is not going to my, my neocortex. It's going to my legs. And so I think um, whatever you teach and you know christina started with this about you know what's normally taught what's what is the what is the context for all of this um and and what else can you do i'll, I'll give you just one example um that's also gets fresh because it's in the new book i've been working on that um that when you say i have a scholarship or there's a there's an opening in my research lab right that's well-intentioned it sounds perfectly you know, anybody can apply. And you've even, you've even said the words, anybody can apply. But what the research tells us is that not everybody hears those words the same way. That the people who look like you, when you say everyone can apply, think, oh, well, I could work in his lab. Um, and the women are less likely to think he means me. And the women of color, et cetera, et cetera, are, are, everybody is, they're less likely. So the, the, the response to this is figure out who might who might I really want to encourage, right? Um, and have, maybe have a private word or be specific about how um, I would love to have a more diverse lab, right? So, um, but not recognizing that not everybody hears what you think is neutral as neutral is a human problem. And, and the best way for me to explain this is to say, it's like when you go to England and you get off the plane and you go, hey, I noticed something different. The people here have an accent. And then you have to think a little longer before you realize, oh, actually, I have the accent. What I thought was normal is just normal to me. And so recognizing that everybody has an accent, everybody, and you have an accent too. And if you have an intellectual accent, or so everything you say to you sounds normal. Sorry, that was more than I wanted to say, but my colleagues can do better. And um, I know Christine, I would, oh, go ahead, Santima. Um, I would like to add that the, the perspective you're coming from does have a huge impact. So I think um, bringing different ideas in, into uh, my classroom might be a, a little bit uh, easier since I am trained as a social psychologist and I'm, I teach uh, mostly psychology courses. So literally we're sitting there trying to understand human behavior, right, and everything that we do. But um, one of the biggest um, tips I could give when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, oftentimes people immediately want to go to race and gender. Don't do that. Don't do that. You got to start with the commonality, right? I identity is what brings us together, right? So oftentimes in these diversity um, trainings, they, they always want to pin, um, pinpoint race and what's going on with gender. I, I think you need to start small and start fun. Um, if, if, if this is something within an institution, you know, start with your mascot, right? At Bennett, we're all bales, right? We bleed blue and white. And first and foremost, that's what's important. We have a shared common identity that makes us bales. Start from there, right? Then share other things. Um, a, a fun act, uh, like icebreaker activity that I've done in my classes, but uh, faculty and staff love it too. Let's do area code shout out. Where are you from, right? People get real excited to be able to start shouting out 704, 276. So now we're going to form an identity based on geographical location. And then you can start with those kind of fun uh, identifications and then you build into the more seriousness because we got to establish trust, right? Um, I'm not going to say safe space. I, I don't believe in safe spaces, right? As, as a minority member, there's no such thing as a safe space for me. I have to walk into a brave space. 
because at any given time, someone is probably going to attack one of my identities. Even if I'm just trying to express the moment you tell me that's not true, I don't feel that, you just attack me. So we don't, we don't operate in safe spaces. We operate in brave spaces. So if you really want to get this idea of diversity, equity, inclusion going and have people recognize it that don't normally see it, I would say start with a shared common identity, establish the trust, and then you can build on to those more controversial identities. Wow, thank you so much, Santiva. Christina, I know you unmuted yourself. Do you want to add to that? I would, thank you. So two things I'm thinking. One is that across fields, we use examples. And so whether our examples are in computational chemistry, in communication, in math, or something in between, the examples that we use and thinking about the ways that we can remove psychological noise. So if my purpose is in teaching a concept what I don't want is the example that I'm using to then send the students on a tangential mental journey where they're like, I don't even know what this example is. How am I gonna know what the concept is? And so one of the things I think about is, um, so I'm part of an academic couple and the, uh, my other half is a computational chemist. And so when he's talking about thermodynamics, he's talking about soup because whether it's minestrone, black bean soup, or it's menudo or something else, there's always soup. And so when you talk about temperature, you can think about the ways that you can use examples so that your examples are facilitating learning, not distracting from it. And I think that that's an important thing um, that we consider is the ways that our examples can be creatively implemented into our classes so that all students have the same starting place. Wow. So these are all fantastic ideas. I think I'm going to be blowing up Twitter with all the quotes that you all are providing today. Uh, and I'd like to make another slight turn. So we just talked about disciplinary thinking. Now, um, as we move into online coursework and in some folks case, they're teaching hybrid or hybrid flexible courses or even in-person classes. We're seeing some questions from the participants about simultaneous or real-time um, experiences. So for instance, are there any ideas on how to improve the real-time classroom experience, be it online, live, or both simultaneously? I'm teaching in a hybrid setting where it's hard to balance what's going on for those at home at the same time as being there for those in the classroom. Any suggestions from the panel for that par uh, participant? And I know there are multiple people asking about this synchronous learning phenomenon. I would, I would start by saying that um, synchronous, like face-to-face, -face, is always the, 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 the mode of teaching that takes the most bandwidth, right? Literally, again, I always pay attention, right? You have to pay attention. It costs you something. And so focusing synchronously and having people together. So if it's on campus, it's driving to campus and all the resources that are used in getting people together. If it's, a, if it's an online course, the synchronous time should be where you put your high value stuff that, that most requires everybody to be together now, right? So if you're gonna do something synchronously, then don't say, okay, well, now I'm just gonna talk for an hour, right? that should be a video. And so I think it's planning what needs to happen synchronously because that is going to take more effort from your participants. They've got a plan, oh, I gotta take care of the child care, right? And so, um, so I think that synchronous can be useful. It's really for what we're doing now, the back and forth, if the more, the more interactive your synchronous sessions are, the more value they are, and the less um, interactive, then the more maybe you should think about making them asynchronous. Santiba, I see you nodding. Do you have anything you want to add? Um, I was thinking about Jose's point of you got to assess the value of it. And um, I'm, I'm in agreement because I'm, I'm sitting here learning with the rest of us because I've currently been using the synchronous but he, he definitely uh, struck a chord with me on that because I think what, and, and in my institution, we run on mini masters. So we're about to go into mini master three. And I'm seriously considering whether or not um, the majority of my class needs to be synchronous and figuring out a way to enhance the engagement um, using asynchronous. And because I saw in the chat, someone um, brought up a very valid point and I actually I ran into this situation with two of my students. Everyone doesn't have access to high-speed internet. So um, when I inquired with my students as to why the camera wasn't on, she honestly said it won't work that way. So as long as she keeps her camera off, she can hear and participate in the chat. 
But as soon as she turns her camera on, things get real spotty. And she said that the, uh, even the audio starts shaking in and out because she doesn't have access to high speed internet. So, um, and then to, to go back to Christina's point, I'm again going to sit down with my learning objectives and figure out how is that mapping on to not the assignments. I, I recently uh, learned that we have to kind of shift our mindset from thinking about assignments, but to evaluations of student progress. I like that, right? Because I think sometimes we throw in all these assignments, but do the assignments really map on to where I'm trying to go? Are these assignments telling me whether or not the students are actually comprehending? So what, what I'm gonna to have to do during our break is, is bringing in the points of, of all my colleagues here in the panel and, and what I'm learning in the chat is maybe the synchronous is only needed for certain components, maybe as a verification piece or whatnot, and then maybe set up the asynchronous so it maps more so onto my evaluations of the student's progress. So I, I don't know, Kevin, this is one of those things where I'm pondering right now myself. Well, we're all actively engaged in this conversation because we are all trying to figure out the best ways to go about it. Farah. Yeah, Kevin, I, Kevin, I will say that, you know, I think, you know, I always, I always say, you know, kind of don't waste a, a tragic moment. Like, what are you, what are you going to learn? And so one thing that I do think that we are going to learn um, from this space is really just restructuring our courses, even when we get back to face to face, but definitely online about, I think we've been in a groove, some, some in academia, like we teach this, we, t we, we create this test, they pass the test, they get a grade and we're done. But really, what we really should be thinking about, and I know some faculty have is like, what are we trying to accomplish, right? And what are the learning objectives? I know that one thing that our faculty have struggled with is, you know, we want lockdown browser, we want proctoring, which of course has issues when you talk about race and um, equity and inclusion amongst themselves, I'm sure the research is pretty clear on some of the issues that are there. So the question is, is a multiple choice 50 minute test really the best way to assess whether or not a student is learning what we wanna learn? Because when they get a job, are they really gonna take a 50 question multiple test? Probably not. And so that's one of the things that will take some time, but I think that we can all learn during this moment is really just shifting to not, I have to cover 10 chapters because that's what this is really about, but what do I really want students to learn? What are the specific learning objectives that I'm trying to accomplish and that is essential? And then just a little kind of tidbit, and I'm sure our instructional, instructional design um, specialist on the um, webinar will, will attest to this. One of the things is, you know, my faculty, when they were moving, they said, you know, let's create a 50 minute, I want my 50 minute lecture. They asked me, could you buy me a whiteboard so I can record my 50 minute lecture? I can take it home, you know, the whole debate about, about me purchasing the, the whiteboard. But the reality is students are not going to sit down and watch a 50 minute video. They're not. Um, one thing, if there's really important things that you want, like, don't, now don't chop, chop, chop a 50 minute video into 10 five minute videos, but shorter videos on specific topics is really a better approach to delivering content than just drawing it out 50. Again, we're trying to take face to face sometimes and control and move it to online. But the reality is that in that old way, face to face might not have been working either. That's I'll absolutely take that. correct. The concepts of cognitive load and letting students process and work with the information, 10 to 15 minute chunks is much better. I know we're running close to the end and I want to give our panelists a chance to maybe, let's, uh, because I brought up Twitter earlier, um, in a tweet sized soundbite, <laughs> maybe each of you can think of a one thing takeaway. What's the one thing you would want your colleagues to do to make their online course more inclusive? What's one thing that you, that would have made a difference to you as a student? Uh, so maybe we can go alphabetically starting with Farah. Oh, let's start with me. Um, I would say that, um, you know, what I see is, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I'm a mathematician, but this mental health thing is real. 
And so I, I really think, you know, our students are asking for it, but we, we got rid of fall break, got rid of all the holidays to compress, send them home before Thanksgiving. And I understand, I think that was the right decision. But again, the rush to teach every single thing is where we, I think, have to pull back. What is important? It's okay. And I know the, I'm sorry, I know the pressure of teaching, they have to go on to the next course, like they make sure they learn, but everybody give out, give themselves and students some grace. What is most important? Prior, prioritize what's most important. Okay, uh, next up, Jose. All right. Uh, so I've already said more structure, more flexibility, so much has been said. Um, what I, I'll, I'll add one of those, so they gotta say something new, right? Um, I'm a big fan of John A. Powell's um, targeted universalism as a way of thinking about this. And what he means by that is that when you think about a process or a procedure or a course, think about what can I do that will benefit uh, the st students who, are, who need it the most, but doesn't hurt anybody else. So transparency is a great example of that. Rubrics are a great example of that, right? It doesn't hurt anybody, but boy, if I don't understand how college works, it helps me even more. So targeted universalism, think about things that you can do that will help your most disadvantaged students. They're probably gonna help everybody, but if they help the privileged students a little less, that's okay, because it doesn't hurt anybody. Wow, that's great. Thank you, Christina. So I think about clear, concise, and frequent communication with care. So a lot of C's in there, but clear, concise communication with care. So frequently communicating with your students, making sure that you're using bulleted lists, clear communication, and reminding them that you care. Not just on day one, not just kind of dropping, I want you to succeed, but I care. And I want you to succeed and I care about you. And I think that if we can do that and we can do that well, then we're succeeding. And that gets back to the <clears throat> empathy that Farah brought up in her opening statement. Santiba, would you like to close us out? Um, I will share the, the same phrase that I'm currently sharing with my colleagues on campus, and that's be bold, be brave, right? We, we can't try to use the same mentalities that we had pre-pandemic to, to teach these courses. We can't assume that even meetings are gonna be held the same way. So we need you to be bold, and we need you to be brave to be able to step out of the boxes that we are accustomed to teaching in. This has been such an incredible discussion. Thank you all so much. Um, and we hope that this is just the start of the conversation. So as we come to a close, we invite all of you to enter one word into the um, menti.com. There's a link in the chat one word that you would use to describe today's discussion. If you go straight to menti.com, if you don't click the link, then you'll need to use the code 6652369. And if you all start putting those in now, we'll be able to share the results in just a minute. While you do that, we would like to thank our partners for their support. We thank our panelists for their time today and the rich ideas they shared with us. And we invite you to continue the conversation online. On the AQ website, you'll find additional resources from today's conversation, including a video recording and a transcript of today's discussion, a full chat transcript, and some other additional resources. You'll see a survey link in the chat, and we rely on feedback to continue to offer you the most relevant and engaging content and would love your feedback. So to recognize the effort We'll select a few respondents who share their name to receive a $50 card of gratitude. Now, while we uh, still have a minute left, let's take a look at how you all describe today's session on menti.com. If you haven't done it yet, I'll put it back in the chat one more time. Here we go, useful. Oh, wow, enlightening, inspiring, informative. I love this tool and it's something that you can use in real time with your own students. Informative, enlightening, inspiring don't seem to change much. So they must be pretty popular. So we hope you'll save the date for our next discussion in a few weeks. It'll be about examining and mitigating implicit bias. That'll be later in October. 
And I just want to close by saying thank you again to our panelists and partners. Everyone, please stay safe and have a great online class.